It's Rog. Quick update before we pod. After we produced this podcast, news broke that the Washington Spirit had separated ways with manager Chris Ward. Ward took over the club after they fired Richie Burt last summer, leading the Spirit to their first ever championship title last season. The Spirit have been largely mum on the topic. We'll have more on this, no doubt, in podcasts to come. To better days ahead for all, here's the pod. Courage. You're listening to the Men in Blazers Media Network, Suboptimal Radio. VAR will ruin ruin the celebrations, though. Imagine, Tierna, you're twerking at the corner flag. No goal. Uh, like, I would just, like, just, just dig my grave and bury me at that corner flag. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, exactly. <laughs> it's Rog back with the women's game, presented by Paramount Plus. A truly tantalising episode, because with me today... I have another iteration of the Stanford Mafia, and what a glorious iteration it is. First up, captain of your Washington spirit, US women's national team, midfield maestro, best Andy since Toy Story, it's Andy Sullivan. Hey, hey, Raj. Thanks for having me back. Oh, any, any, any time, Andy Sullivan. And joining you, we have... Really the red star we miss most on the field, week in, week out right now. One of the greatest ACL rehabbers in the history of the National Women's Soccer League. And officials are of professional sports, all of them in Chicago. It's the one and only Tina Davidson. Hi, how are you? Oh, Tina, I am so bloody happy to see you. And I want to ask you off the top, because this season has been... Well, frustratingly, you're five months into the recovery on the ACL injury that you sustained during the Challenge Cup, out for the entire season. And last time we spoke to you, you'd just gone back from a family madcap trip to Dublin. And I know you were in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago. Where are we in the point of your recovery? Are you starting to get antsy, itching to be back on the field, or are you just hitting your sabbatical stride? <laughs> No, I, I, I definitely am antsy. I feel like I've been antsy since day one, but I just started running um, a week and a half ago. So <laughs> doing a progression, as I'm sure Andy can attest to, um, it is not fun to do slow, steady state running as a soccer player. <laughs> I was telling one of my teammates today, I said, I wish and I will pray for the day that I can do box to boxes because I miss them so much <laughs> running for three minutes straight slow and steady um but everything's going well how is it emotionally that first step Oof. I feel like it's a little bit of dejection because you're so excited and then you're like oh wow this doesn't feel normal this definitely like there are definitely still discomforts in different parts of your body so you would hope as soon as you start running that you start feeling good but it definitely does take a bit to get back into it but at least it's been feeling better every time I've stepped out there. Um, so I can't really complain. <laughs> is it, is this the longest you've ever gone without football? Oh, yeah. I, the longest I'd ever gone without football was probably three months before. So this will be quite a long time. <laughs> Andy, what's the longest you've ever gone without football? I did the, the ACL crew back in college. So that was, I think, mm-hmm. eight or nine months for me. But the, the first running steps, I have a fond picture in my mind of what those were like, because you finally get to the point, like Tuna said, you're so excited about it. And then I remember the coach being like, okay, I was on the line just to stride out. And he was like, okay, go. And I just remember standing there being like, I don't know how to start. I don't know how to begin. So I, I get what Tuna's saying about, you know, you're excited for it and you're ready. And then you feel awkward and terrible, but it's all all part of it. But I don't want to project because I don't know how to begin ever when someone says run. But, but but you're a professional athlete. So what was that? That was just the need for the reinforcement of muscle memory. I think so. I think we take for granted how much we do on a regular basis and how normal it is to us. But to somebody else, it's not. I remember doing a, a recovery run at one point where it was I had not been training for maybe two weeks and I was starting to get back into it and just wanted to work on like changing direction and I told my dad I was like oh I'm doing this like really easy workout why don't you come with me and it was three rounds <laughs> for a couple minutes and he did the first round was really struggling second round he did not participate third round was like you know every fourth rep of 
just and it was just like jog <laughs> jog forward back pedal you know shuffle shuffle start again just to get your body used to that so i think um after you just you just get used to doing things for a while so when you haven't run for a while it definitely feels weird at first but every step gets better and better oh, tina based on your instagram i am pretty sure and this is not scientific that you've attended more professional sporting events in chicago this season than anyone else in the Chicago land region, including a Red Stars doubleheader at Soldier Field with Chicago Fire at the end of June when you were the designated fire starter during the fire game. Got to admit, a little bit disappointed to learn this involved a lot of flag waving and absolutely no literal fire starting. I'm sure you were disappointed too. Yeah, I didn't really know exactly what it entailed. And of course, I asked way too many questions. One of the operations people at Chicago Fire used to work for us and she's the one that asked me to do it and I was getting into her I was like how big is the flag how heavy is it is it going to be difficult because like last thing I want to do is go out in front of thousands of people and like not be able to wave this flag properly <laughs> <laughs> oh I thought you were like asking what am I burning down how big is it where do I light it <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely sweaty and nervous because I'm always sweaty and nervous in those kinds of situations but <laughs> it went fine in <laughs> my my weeks and months of upper body training <laughs> over these past couple of months really paid off. Oh, hashtag team sweaty and nervous. <laughs> I am asking for, for a reason that um, something you said when you were last on the show, you said your rehab and you are a, you are an incredibly, I, I find optimistic person who seems to try and find silver linings in remarkable fashion. I find quite inspirational. You said your rehab was giving you time to be a student of the game in a way you hadn't had time for previously. And I am interested, attending those games as a spectator rather than a player, is there anything that you've seen or learned that you didn't think you would have learned otherwise? It's much easier to watch soccer and learn things when you're not actually playing the game, just because you don't have to think about, oh, what am I going to do? Or like, oh, how are we going to win this game? You don't, There's no... There's none of those thoughts. It's really just what are people doing? How are people playing? And I feel like this has always been the case for me watching soccer, like watching Premier League. I watch my position and I'm like, oh, that's something that I should try out or like, oh, that's something I should look for. So I, I definitely feel like I've been able to learn from my teammates. I've been able to learn about other teams in our league, which is so important when I come back finally. But then also watching the fire play, you get to learn some things that you don't see in your own game and you don't see in a woman's game that you might bring in. There's certain ways that they defend forwards that are super athletic that I feel like I would hope to bring into my game, especially given when I first come back, I probably won't be very athletic. Um, <laughs> but also the way that their forwards make some movements that I might have to be aware of as, as you know, all forwards in our league are just becoming more complex and even better players and so just being able to watch those things without having to immediately put it into your game but like have some time to digest it and just really truly be a student has been nice the chicago fire thing is also interesting to me because mls and nwsl have such a often ambiguous relationship sometimes they're partners sometimes they're in marketplace competition and the Red Stars and the Fire, they're not officially affiliated, but you often share facilities. You do collaborate on different strategies. And I'm curious, how do you experience that relationship as a player? I feel like there's a lot of potential there for us to have a really great partnership, whether or not we're owned by the same um, group. But I, I think that we need to start with like actually getting introduced to each other <laughs> because we see each other all the time, but we, you know, you see him on the field and you see him in the hallway, but you don't actually, be, you don't really know them. Shakiri, first week he was here, came into our weight room and I was lifting, was like, hi, good morning. And I was like, this has never happened before. Good morning. <laughs> I feel like some of the players that have kind of been there, done that are actually more apt to go out of their way. Like when Bastian Schweinsteiger was on the team, he was the most consistent player in terms of saying hello to us, you know, asking us how we're doing, whatever it is. And it doesn't, I mean, we don't need to be best friends, but to have those relationships at least a little bit would be awesome. God love Bastian Schweinsteiger. Andy, you're in a similar position with the Spirit and DC United. The only difference being that your husband Drew actually plays for DC United, 
which I'm fairly sure constitutes an official affiliation in the eyes of the law. <laughs> But like, would you like to see more crossover between the two clubs? So you're like, God, no, I already have to run into my husband too often at work. <laughs> no, I'd love to see more crossover. Any more time with Drew is is positive. But um, there was like some awkwardness at first. Now we are actually all at the same facility. We share the gym. Our fields are next to each other. We share a lot of spaces. And like Chad Ashton and Wayne Rooney were both so welcoming and warm and like Wayne Rooney especially is like yeah like you guys do whatever you need to do and um and actually a new player came to DC United recently and said hello to a player who was lifting and the player was like whoa this has never happened like kind of why are you saying hi to me um and then I talked to him later and he was like well why is it weird um so I think the players on the spirit and DC United both want to get closer and now the staffs want to get closer we're getting there. So that's it's definitely positive and, and good. But yeah, some, some hurdles to overcome for sure. We are going to dive right into NWSL action in just a minute because there is a lot to cover. But I do want to discuss something that we have not yet touched upon on this podcast. And I can't believe we have not discussed it. It's a Stanford Cardinal colored elephant in the room. And for anyone who doesn't know, you two play together at the mighty Stanford along with Alana Cook Cap Macario, Sam Hyatt, Jane Campbell, Jordan Baggett, T. McGrady. Feels actually half the league, honestly. Naomi Gurma, Sophia Smith. You know, go back a couple of seasons. Kelly O'Hara, Christmas Press, Ali Riley. I could honestly keep going. And first of all, alumni often share a bond, even across generations. Do you all feel that with other Stanford players, even those you weren't actually at school with at the same time? Or because there's so bloody many of you, is it at this point just no big deal? I definitely feel like you share that connection. I think especially because we've all had the same coach. There are a lot of consistencies and similarities just because you you just know exactly what's going to happen. Like you can tell what preseason's going to be. You can kind of chat about that. Like, so I think I think that's something that really does make it even stronger. But I would say, you know, even with Stanford alumni that that didn't play on the team, that just friends or colleagues or whatever, there is just a bit of of, of a connection um, just because it's a special place and it's a unique experience. And having experienced that, whether it was at the same time or 10, 15 years apart, um, some of it doesn't change. The connection that I have to soccer players, but also to Oh, like any alum, just because the Stanford experience is so unique, especially, you know, your freshman year and all the tradition that's involved in that, um, both as a, a normal student and as a soccer player, uh, so much of that is passed down every single year. Um, so there's a lot of commonalities. And Paul is a very consistent man. Um, <laughs> and it's funny, <laughs> there's so often times where like something happened at Stanford and we kind of like be like, oh, Paul, you know, roll our eyes at him. And just, you know, what's he going on about? But every once in a while, we'll we'll text each other or text our class and be like, remember when Paul used to say this? Like, oh, he was so right. And <laughs> um, how just seeing how these themes pop up in different different ways. But I think the fact that so many Stanford players are in the league and doing so well in the league is such a testament to him and his program and how he teaches. Although we may have rolled our eyes once or twice, but he is a very great, uh, teacher of the game and the style that he like wants to play uh, I think helps prepare people for the next level but what is it about the way that Paul Ratcliffe the Stanford coach leads that has allowed the program to produce so many pros who can make that transition from the college game to the professional ranks it almost starts before you get to Stanford like he the program the school attracts a certain kind of player a player that likes to study the game, a player that wants to learn from others. I think that's what he looks for and that's what the school attracts. And so I, I feel that once you get there, you're already set up for success because of the people that you have around you. And so I, f I feel that we have been successful as a team there and then as individual players beyond because we are surrounded with such great people, both as players and you know, our teammates and our coaches. And Everybody wants to be a teacher and everybody wants to be a student. And I think that's something that is sometimes hard to find in athletes that are very good. The amount of, of soccer knowledge that I learned 
not just from my coaches, but also from my teammates is, is really unparalleled. And I feel like there was such a great growth experience for me. I remember when I was making the decision of where I wanted to go to college and seeing the players that were there or that were committing there around my age. They were people who I really admired. And we may not have been very similar in personality, but they were people who I was like gravitated to, who I wanted to spend more time with because I admired who they were as people and soccer players. There's so much excellence to inspire you all around the university, on the soccer team, in the athletic department, in the classroom, in the research. Everyone is striving to the utmost. And um, it's so incredible to be around. And I also, to be honest, I've never stepped into such a strong team culture. You've said that you feel a sense of kinship when you come up against a fellow Cardinal in the NWSL. Do you also feel an enhanced sense of competition? Is an enhanced sense of competition even possible for two very competitive people? But when you come up against a fellow Stanford graduate, are you like, God, I'm going to show them? I think you're like that with every single person you play. I think you always build up a story um, or or not that you, you stay consistent, whether you're a storyteller or not. But um, I think in the league is small. We're all familiar with each other, whether it's as you played together, you know, locally growing up in youth teams college you know international it it trades you know everybody so there's always some history there but we all have a an understanding of each other and respect for each other so i, I do think that we always want to bring our best and you always you you're rooting for them when you're not playing against them and then when you're playing against them it's a different story objective question for you both has stanford officially surpassed unc as the top women's football school in the world that's, I feel like that's, a, a, that's question, a loaded yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like we have performed very well in, in the recent years, but UNC is always up there as well. It's not like they've slacked off. I mean, of course, you can't really say, oh, they've won every single national championship like they used to, but also I think the college game has just grown so much that that's just not the case anymore. So... I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that you can crown one powerhouse as much as you used to be able to just because there is so much more quality and, and wealth around the, around the NCAA. That was so well said. God, that, were, <laughs> that was, a, just for the facts, that was what was called a leading question, Your Honor. But the, the reality is, the one lesson I take from that answer is that were I president, which sadly, well, thanks to for America, I can never be, um, Tina Davidson would be the head of my diplomatic corps. That was an incredibly... She could head any you part could... of your cabinet. I would have full trust in her. Any part. You could just say that that was my, my father, Greg Davidson, speaking through me. Lawyer of 30 years. I know how to answer questions with a non-answer. <laughs> the transition in general from college to NWSL and how that's changing is something I want to touch upon. We had Casey Stoney, the magnificent Casey Stoney, back in June on this show. Casey Stoney said that she felt that her straight from college rookies were coming in less prepared for the professional game. Is that something either of you have experienced from your perspective at all? I think that for me goes back to how much I appreciate Paul Radcliffe and how much he taught about the game, not just about what he wanted in that moment, but the game in general and how you how you make decisions on the field. So I think there's a theme with certain programs where you see that more player players are more prepared to come into the game. Um, but there are also exceptions to that rule, right? It doesn't I there's so many players in this league who didn't go to a a power f- five school who crush it in the league. So um I think it's all about again, your your coach, but also the ownership of your game and how you decide to learn and to continue to learn throughout your career because also you could come in unprepared maybe as a rookie but if your ability to adapt adapt is good you can jump right in i also think something that's so difficult to adapt from the college game to our league is the length of it and how physically grueling it is and i think that's something that is often overlooked is like your college season is very very short it's you know three and a half months two games a week boom you blink it's done Whereas here, it feels like you are crawling over the finish line by the time you get to the end of the uh, end of the season, whether it's 
you know, you're physically falling apart or you're just tired. Like there's so much more travel. It's long travel. And so I think that's something that you have to learn very quickly as a rookie, how to take care of yourself off the field, which is something that's, that's about maturity, learning from others, something that often you don't do in college is take care of yourself off the field. And also utilizing resources that aren't shoved in your face. I feel like you have to take more ownership of your game and that involves taking taking advantage of of what is available, helping your body, your mind recover. I feel like also being able to stay focused for six, seven, eight months, however long we end up playing is hard. It's hard to stay focused for that long. And if you're used to being focused only for three or four months, it can take a bit of time to understand how to do that without burning out. Um, and a little bit of trial and error. Maybe you do get burnt out. Maybe you, you aren't physically recovered for a game and you don't perform well. But um, I think that's part of the process. Pivoting back to the present, the pro game, and all the action of this past weekend, starting on Friday, where we saw Kansas City current season. No wonder continue they shattered and this was magical their attendance glass ceiling in a 1-1 draw with Angel City a game played out to a crowd of over 10,000 highlight of that game obviously the Lola Bonta fake injury to twerk goal Selly after an 80 second minute equalizing penalty the Bonta later revealing that the concept had first been suggested by a fan on Twitter and when you guys see that move and the incredible global reaction to it how does it play in locker rooms does it set you all abuzz with creativity Are you all loving it is it like a desire to copycat or knock on effect I think for both Tierra and I <laughs> You're talking to the wrong yeah. people. <laughs> You're thinking, how? what would it take to get us to do that? And I have no answer for you. I have no, nowhere close. But I do think that <laughs> others see that. Um, I know I have teammates, like Trin's had some awesome celebrations this year. And that it just showcases her her personality. Yeah, like I, I love to see it. I would hate to see it against me on the field in the moment. But I... For me, especially knowing low, and I, I texted Jane Campbell about it, and I was like, I would love to show that much like joy in a moment sometime <laughs> soon. Um, obviously, that sounds kind of dark, uh, but yeah, maybe maybe score a goal would be cool and celebrate in that way. But I just, I don't, I don't see it for me. I don't think Tierna, you see it for me either. I don't see it for you. No, I feel like you're talking to two people who who don't like doing making any sort of grab for attention <laughs> turn and run I feel back like, to midfield yeah I feel like but what's funny is that I could say at least for me that scoring a goal is is so unusual that I just won't have a celebration ever prepared but then Becky goes and scores a goal and pulls out a fantastic celebration and I'm like well shit, maybe I need to think of one <laughs> it's a one single player celebration that does stick in your guy's mind as a classic very rarely do women celebrate in a single fa- in a single fashion. So it's much more unique in our game. So when it comes around, you're like, oh, that's kind of fun and exciting. Because like really often in the women's game, you see us celebrating with our team, celebrating with whoever assisted the goal or like whatever. Like you just run to teammates. You see it very frequently in the men's game where they go and they have their planned celebration and they do their whole thing. I think that's what kind of makes it fun sometimes. You're like, oh, you have seen that in a couple of weeks. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> VAR will ruin ruin the celebrations though. Uh, mm. You know, we don't have that issue in our league, but imagine scoring, doing your, imagine Tierna, you're twerking at the corner flag. No goal. Like, uh, I would just like, just, just dig my grave and bury me at that corner flag. <laughs> yeah. <I'd> exactly. <laughs> so, so now, now what do we do is like, you're waiting, you're waiting, and then you wait till it's confirmed because it, usually it's confirmed by just, it's kickoff. Right. Yeah. So where is the direction of celebrations going? We're getting to the real issues of soccer here. There's too much joy in football. Let VAR eradicate it completely. Andy, you said something amazing. Like, you would not like that against you. In those moments when you have conceded, is it just too much to bear that that joy 
on the other side of the field. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a very much a team bias. Like if my teammate do that, I'd be like, yeah, go on. Like <laughs> you're feeling it. But if someone would do that to me, I'd be like, I would never do that to you. <laughs> um, so it's just, I know it makes no logical sense, but that's what, there is some research about this, about sports. Um, did you ever learn about that in college too with like the sports team study? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like if pretty much, participants were primed by they were either asked whether they were a fan of like soccer or they were asked oh are you um a chelsea fan or a tottenham fan something with a rivalry and then they would walk by someone in the opposing shirt and if they were talked about how much they love soccer in general they would help that person if they talked about how much they love their team and they pass someone in the opposite jersey who needed help they wouldn't help the person so it's just that's just sports loyalty so in the game i'm thinking of m- me and my team whereas maybe outside of soccer or when i'm just observing the game i'm thinking yeah like soccer celebrations i also think something that really grinds my gears is i'm like you had the audacity to plan a celebration because you thought you were going to score against us that's yeah. what really bothers me of like you can't have a plan celebration thinking there's no way that you're going to score against us <laughs> it should be a freaking surprise so that's what bothers me. But then, of course, if my teammates in the locker room being like, oh, I think I'm going to do this if I score. I'd be like, yeah, go on, do it. So it's told it up a standard. <laughs> and we know it. There's no such thing as rationale in sports, and that's why we love it. But God bless Lola Bonta, an NWSL veteran, been in the league since 2015, currently tied for six in the league scoring with five goals on the season. And she was all over the game against L.A., and has really solidified into one of Kansas City's key players this season. Another Stanford grad, it should be said. I think you overlapped Andy with her for one year in college. What's your take on Lowe? What specifically about her game has allowed her to stay so consistent since she entered the league? One of my first impressions of Lowe really was during our first game, there's a lot of tradition beforehand that I didn't really know about. And so we're all huddled in the locker room and I'm kind of, I don't, what are we doing? And all of a sudden Lowe starts walking around the circle, pacing, making eye contact, pointing, t- talking about, I couldn't tell you one thing she said. <laughs> Just amazing passion, intensity, like the biggest pump up speech I've ever experienced. Cause I think it was so, fo- that type was so foreign to me at the time. And so I was ready to run through a brick wall. I was ready to do that for four years. I think it's so many of those traditions are what like cemented my love for Stanford and the culture that we had. But Lowe is such a strong personality, like so confident, always laughing, always making a joke to a point sometimes where I, you know, wanted to fight her a little bit. Um, And again, that's great. But I think that's that's what has made her such a an amazing player throughout the league is that she brings that personality to her play. She brings some flair, but that's what I'm most impressed with her is how much she's grown, like on the defensive side of the ball and her work rate has just gotten better and better each year. And she, you know, in college, she was a pure 10 and she's, you know, shifted to playing some more holding ro- roles at times. So I think she's improved a ton on both sides of the ball. Um, but yeah, she smashed pens like that in college, so that's nothing new. Speaking of league top scorers, Alex Morgan edging out in front again on Saturday during San Diego's 3-1 comeback win over Houston. Alex racking up her 12th goal on the season, a stunning left-footed strike from a tricky, spectacular angle. Alex's 50th goal in the NWSL, which is an impressive stat. But also when you break it down, It means that in her ninth season, over 20% of her league goals have been scored in this campaign. Really, a symbol of just how much of a renaissance we are currently watching. And you both know Alex so well. You played alongside her and against her. How do you both understand what we're witnessing this season? Is it Casey Stoney and the San Diego effect? Is it something internal? Is it something just in the water down there in San Diego? It's like a second awakening. I think probably part of it for her is is being on a team and in a place that she really thrives and she really enjoys. And that works wonders for you as a football player if you're in a good headspace. And I also think something that's been really great for her and is really great for any player is, is remaining healthy throughout a season. 
um, which is fantastic to see because oftentimes, especially when you're doing a lot of club and country and going back and forth, it's hard to remain healthy. And, and she's done that um, and has been able to perform at, at both levels. And it's really just great to see. I feel like as soon as you see her kind of take that touch on her left foot, you're like, ah, that's going in. <laughs> that's that's not something that's going to be saved. It's not something that's going to be blocked. Um, and it's like her trademark thing. So it's, it's really great to see her thriving. Yeah, I think she spoke about earlier this season about how she was able to give more of herself to her club this year. And I think it's just such a hard balance between club and country. And, you know, she was not getting called in for a while. And I think she said, well, I'll show you. And I think that is part of the mentality that makes the national team so successful. She could have she could have said, "Oh, I have a great career or I'm at a great club team, you know, I'm my family life is good. I'm like I'm good." And she was like, "No, I'm going to show you that I'm still not just valuable, but like I'm the best." And I love that. I love that energy. A lot of focus right now on Alex's race with Sophia Smith with whom we have a pod special coming up just next week. That's a quick plug for that beauty. But huge respect to Diana Ordonez, the 20-year-old Courage rookie who currently sits just two goals behind Alex with 10 goals on the season. Ordonez scored a brace on Saturday in the Courage's. Apologies, Tierna. 4-0 takedown of the Chicago Red Stars. A much-needed win. From North Carolina perspective, they were sitting in last place going to this weekend. That desperation to win, Becky Sauerbrunn said something I thought was really, really interesting when she was on last week. She was comparing losing to drowning, saying that the more you lose over the course of a season, the harder and harder it gets to break through to the surface again. But once you finally win again, you get that air into your lungs and it suddenly feels like anything is possible. Is that a metaphor that resonates with you both? Well, she's speaking to me right now. Uh, It's been a while since the spirit have gotten a win and I'm definitely desperate for it. And that's, you know, been our mentality every week is like, okay, this is the week that we're going to get the win and we're going to change the tides. Um, So, yeah, I think that the way she put that is is so accurate. And I think when your team is winning everything feels great and then when your team is losing everything feels not so great and i think you have to have the perspective in both the highs and lows that the truth is somewhere in between you know staying humble analyzing your strengths and weaknesses equally in both those situations to keep that level-headed perspective because every day that's all you can do is focus on improving where you need to improve And finally, closing out the games from the weekend, we had the ICC Women's Cup doubleheader. Leon beating Monterey 4-0 in the ICC final. Your Portland Thorns losing out to Mighty Chelsea in the third place match. O.R. Rain beating Racing Louisville in the final of the Women's Cup. So many cups, so little time. And looking on as competitors, particularly the ICC, I am curious what you both see there. The Thorns, you could say, underestimated Monterey in their semi-final. They pulled a lot of their starters. They lost on penalties. Then fighting hard, but ultimately going down to Chelsea. Is this just middle of the season fatigue? They've played a lot of games recently. All the other teams are coming in fresh from their off-season. Is it a, any kind of statement about the development of leagues outside the US, especially in the case of Monterey, who's safe to say were not favourites going to that semi-final matchup? Was it more just at the thorns? This was just not a priority at the moment with the Shield and the playoffs to come. How do you understand what we saw this weekend? I I feel like it's probably a combination. I do think that it's really great to have these tournaments to kind of have a bit of a check to see how the leagues match up against each other. Um, Having all the best teams from different leagues around the world come together and play is always exciting to kind of see because each league is different and they have different qualities to, to the game. And so while teams may be great, they might be different than a team from, you know, Europe teams at the NWSL, you just might play the game totally different. And so it'll be an interesting matchup. But I also do think Portland pulling their starters and and choosing to to put a different lineup out there might have also been a, a choice to to rest some players when they could get rest um, in preparation for the last quarter of the season, which um, becomes incredibly important with how tight the race for the Shield is and how tight the race for playoffs is. And did you watch these games and just think, God, this is just a tiny taste of what a club World Cup could and should be in the years to come? Yeah, when you watch these games, you just wonder what could be. And it's great that those teams got an opportunity to do it and are paving the way. But we want to make 
we all want we all want a piece <laughs> um, in a way that makes sense. And it's just very hard with our different schedules when it makes sense for everybody. Um, because obviously summertime we're mid season, they're preseason, winter time, they're mid season, we're preseason. So it's just so hard to find a time where it's really you're able to just evaluate it from that pure compare the clubs, compare the compare the leagues. God, the club world cup. That is the world I want to live in. Looking to the weekend ahead. First up, it's Orlando Pride against OL Rain Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern on Paramount Plus. Remember, try Paramount Plus free on us by going to paramountplus.com slash MIB TWG. That's MIB TWG. Try it. You will not regret it. You'll be able to see Saturday, Tierna's Red Stars going to Racing Louisville. That's 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Paramount Plus. Do you miss away days, Tierna? Or is that one aspect of the game that you're happy enough sitting out? I definitely don't miss like having to pack every week and getting delayed in airports and not being home and, you know, having to live out of a suitcase. But you also miss a lot of team bonding moments when you're on the road just because things happen. It's not like they're planned, but oftentimes, you know, fun events happen or you might just sit in somebody's hotel room and chat for an hour or two and get to know somebody better. So I definitely do miss the, you know, the part of spending more time with the team. But hopefully United keeps my status, even though I don't have enough (laughs) flights for that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> united i know you're listening get on that At customer united. service <laughs> help me keep my status <laughs> we're with you at united what the wtf at 8 30 <laughs> on saturday on paramount plus and these washington spirit take on the houston dash and at 10 30 p.m eastern time it's a top of the table clash an epic epic rumble as the thorns duke it out with san diego for that top spot my lord sophia smith going up against alex morgan let's get ready to rumble then on sunday 5 30 p.m on old pp it's east coast versus west coast old style gotham go head to head with angel city angel city fighting to get back into a playoff spot gotham Honestly, at this point, just looking for a singular win. And last, but never least, 7 p.m. Eastern, Lola Bonta, double L, her Kansas City current, take on Diana Ordonez's North Carolina Courage. Come for the football, stick around for the sellies. That game, streaming on Twitch. And that is it for this week. As usual, oh, we're going to come out on a high point of joy, a burst of wonder, a weekly note of light in this dark, dark world. Tierna, take it away. Tell us something that's bringing you joy this week. Andy, go first. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I'll go first. My nephew is a little older than three, and he's starting school for the first time. And my sister sent a picture of him outside of his new school. And um, due to covid and soccer i haven't been able to spend as much time with him as i like so i'm known as the aunt that sends him shoes um so i zoomed in on his shoes to see like how are his shoes doing like what kicks is he wearing and on the shoes his name was written on like the velcro and i just thought how wholesome is that so my sister was shocked that i noticed but i was just thinking Shout out to all the people who are going back to school, all the parents who are writing the initials and the names on all the articles of clothing and the belongings and the teachers who are preparing for all that madness. So my nephew's little sneakers with his name on it is what is bringing me joy this week. That is beautiful. Shout out especially to all the teachers. What is your nephew's name? His name is Cormac. Cormac. Cormac, you beautiful human being, only 15 more years of your school education. That is, <laughs> that is, that's quite a heavy load. Oh, Tina, it's time. Take us to a happier place. I feel like Andy's answer has inspired me twofold. One fold is my dad started his, Craig. yeah, my dad started his job as a high school teacher um this week is his first year of teaching at my old high school thank goodness i'm not there anymore because i couldn't take that but um (laughs) uh it's we'll be excited to hear about how he deals with unruly freshmen and all that business um but also uh a week ago or so i visited um casey and her new kid 
with Alyssa and we got to meet Caleb, her baby, which was so adorable. First time I've ever held a newborn. Um, so I was a little bit stressed, sweaty and nervous through about <laughs> sweaty that. Sweaty and nervous. <laughs> Hashtag uh, sweaty and nervous. But a big shout out to her, to um, Sarah Waldmo, who just had her kid as well. Um, Kaylea, who's due in October. Julie, who also just had her kid. We just got a whole band of um, great kids at the end of his cell. But um, we're going to have God. quite the bomb crew with the three, Casey, Sarah, and Kaylea next year. <laughs> whole new generation of chicago oh, red star fans a fame lawyer your dad becoming a teacher yeah Greg is the most beautiful <laughs> human being oh full my God. of patience and wisdom yeah Amazing. i just he's gonna have a conniption that i'm talking about him on here he listens he, so? he, he listens to everything that i'm at that that i'm on he's my biggest fan it's so cool. god love greg having to listen to my crap your daughter is amazing <laughs> whatever greg's done this is he's going to be teaching just shouting out objection constantly in class and i love it he actually did a program at stanford that allows you to like pivot careers so a lot of people who have had a very successful career in, in one silo um do this program and um kind of pivot to something else or just meet other people and, and find new opportunities um so actually had the pleasure of being on campus with him for a little bit at the same time which stanford alumni have a special connection he was class of 85 so we still have we could talk about some things that still happened at the school that happened when he was there, but um, getting selfies from him and my teammates around campus was cringeworthy, but also very cute. Amazing. Um, but yeah, he uh, decided that he really liked teaching. He really liked tutoring kids um, when he was in that program. And so he started out a couple years ago as a fourth and seventh grade teacher taught at a elementary middle school um, in the neighborhood for a, a bit and has finally made the jump to high school, um, which is a whole nother monster. I feel like you, you're no longer like, oh, the cool Mr. Davidson, you know, kids are happy to see you and are just nice and innocent. Now you have teenagers that have a whole nother attitude and a whole lot of hormones. So um, it'll be interesting to, see, to hear uh, his stories. <laughs> so more to come. God love. <laughs> God love to the mighty Greg. That is inspirational. And to all those who are constantly seeking new challenges and just new experience at every moment of their lives. That truly is the kind of inspiration that we need to end on. And I'm so bloody grateful to you. Tina Davidson, thank you for being with us. You are the single greatest. Godspeed. Thanks for having both of us on here. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Sullivan, I want you to know, it always brightens my life talking to you. Likewise. Um, as soon as we get done with the chit chat and you turn on your the women's game voice, I just get very excited. <laughs> so um, and enjoy all the laughs we have. So thank you for, for having us as well. Yeah, I meant it. You were just being diplomatic in response, but your, se your surging sense of optimism is genuinely the joy we all need. This is Rog wishing you all courage. Courage.